Well, good morning, everybody. I'd like you, if you would, to turn with me in the scriptures to, once again, to Ezekiel chapter 16. This is our third message on this chapter, but uh, by reason of a, of a good excuse, it's the longest chapter in the book of Ezekiel with 63 uh, verses. And we're going to read from verse 44 down to verse 59. And as we uh, read this section, uh, I want to give a title right at the beginning, and it's this, Worse Than Sodom. And it's a terrible thing if, by comparison, your conduct is considered to be worse than Sodom. But that's exactly what we're going to read in this little section. So beginning in verse 43 of Ezekiel 16, it says this, Because thou hast not, uh, that's 43, verse 44, sorry. Behold, everyone that useth proverbs shall use this proverb against thee, saying, as is the mother, so is her daughter. Thou art thy mother's daughter that loatheth her husband and her children, and thou art the sister of thy sisters which loathe their husbands and their children. Your mother was an Hittite and your father an Amorite. And thine elder sister is Samaria, she and her daughters, that dwell at thy left hand, and thy younger sister that dwelleth at thy right hand is Sodom and her daughters. Yet hast thou not walked after their ways, nor done after their abominations, but as if that were a very little thing, thou hast corrupted more than they in all thy ways." As I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom thy sister hath not done, she nor her daughters, as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy, and they were haughty and committed abominations before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw good. Neither hath Samaria committed half of thy sins, but thou hast multiplied thine abominations more than they, and hast justified thy sisters in all thine abominations which thou hast done. Thou also, which hast judged thy sisters, bear thine own shame for thy sins, but thou hast committed more abominable than they, they are more righteous than thou. Yea, be thou confounded also, and bear thy shame, in that thou hast justified thy sisters. When I shall bring again their captivity, the captivity of Sodom and her daughters, and the captivity of Samaria and her daughters, then will I bring again the captivity of thy captives in the midst of them. That thou mayest bear thine own shame, and mayest be confounded in all that thou hast done, in that thou art a comfort unto them. When thy sisters Sodom and her daughters shall return to their former estate, and Samaria and her daughters shall return to their former estate, then thou and thy daughters shall return to your former estate. For thy sister Sodom was not mentioned by thy mouth in the day of thy pride. Before thy wickedness was discovered, as at the time of thy reproach of the daughters of Syria and all that are round about her, the daughters of the Philistines, which despise thee round about, thou hast borne thy lewdness and thine abominations, saith the Lord. For thus saith the Lord God, I will even deal with thee as thou hast done, which hast despised the oath in breaking the covenant. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us. Uh, this morning. And again, what, what an amazing passage of scripture that says the sins of Jerusalem and Judah were greater than that of Samaria and of Sodom. And so you can see why the title, Worse Than Sodom, what, what a terrible thing to say. And of course, we, we want to just notice something here in the text, and that is the, the use of more in verses 47 and 51 and 52. And so you notice that God's going to use the term more four times. And so he says in verse 47, uh, you have corrupted yourselves more than they in all thy ways, speaking of Samaria and Sodom. So that's the first reference to more than. 
And then we see it again in verse 51. Neither hath Samaria committed half of thy sins, but thou hast multiplied thine abominations more than they. Again, verse 52, twice now he's going to use the term more. He says, thou also which hast judged thy sisters, bear thine own shame for thy sins that thou hast committed more abomin abominable than they. That's the first one. And the second one, and this is a terrible thing. When somebody says to you that Samaria and Sodom were more righteous than thou. Now, you don't want to be compared with Sodom. But if somebody said to you, actually, you actually make Sodom look righteous, <laughs> then you're in bad shape, right? You're in a terrible condition. And that's how bad Judah had become uh, when God himself makes that comparison. So this is not the opinions of mere men. This is God's assessment of Jerusalem and Judah and why it was essential that they be judged. He's already judged Samaria, the northern kingdom. He's already judged Sodom. And these people have out -sinned them, <laughs> if that's a term. He'd out Sodom. Therefore, judgment was inevitable. And so this is uh, the context of our passage. So he says in verse 44, uh, Behold, everyone that useth proverbs shall use this proverb against thee, saying, As is the mother, so is her daughter. So proverbs uh, are very common in Israel. In fact, we're going to be seeing quite a number of them um, as we proceed. Uh, next chapter 17, there's going to be a proverb there as well. And so they were used quite frequently in Israel, short, pithy sayings with meaning. And the proverb users of the day would use one of Judah and Jerusalem. And this is the one they're using. As is the mother, so is the daughter. Because it's the feminine equivalent that we would understand of like father, like son, right? I mean, just the same idea. Or another one that we would often use is the apple, doesn't fall far from the tree. Now, you probably heard that one as well. I don't know. But it's those kind of sayings. And it's really just saying Judah had become like her mother. Now, we need to be reminded, and the text thankfully does that, who does who is God referring to as her mother? Well, look back to verse 2 of this lengthy chapter. It says, Son of man caused Jerusalem to know her abominations, and say, verse 3, Thus saith the Lord God unto Jerusalem, Thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite, thy mother an Hittite. Now again, when we explained that, we said, that's not saying that was not really the real descent. But what, what God was saying is that you, in your conduct, it's like that you're born of the land of Canaan, because your sin... Uh, is that of the Canaanite. So Judah had become like her mother, the Canaanite, a taunting reminder of what he said in verse 3. Of course, um, uh, it, it's a proverb would, would accurately be said of Judah in Ezekiel's day. Uh, your father was an Amorite, your mother a Hittite. Israel acted just like those pagan nations. And of course, because God is consistent, Remember we said that the, the land of Canaan vomited out its inhabitants because of their sinfulness that's listed so clearly in the book of Leviticus, uh, chapters like chapter 18, the reason why God uh, destroyed the Canaanites. Now when his people have out the Canaanites, what is God to do but to act consistently with his own character? And so once again, the land is going to vomit them out. And that's why they're going into captivity, because they had basically out the Canaanites. And so, uh, like mother, like daughter, their conduct was just like the Canaanites. And the tragedy is, God had called Israel and Judah to be different from the pagan nations. They were meant to be a light to the nations, and now their conduct was worse than the nations. And it's good to remind ourselves, too, that the New Testament bride of Christ has not also has, has also been called to be different from the world. And I'm thinking first Peter four verse four, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot 
speaking evil of you. And the idea is this, that as believers, we should be different from the world. Our conduct, what we live for, how we live our lives, we're meant to be a light, right? Our assemblies are, are meant to be lampstands shining brightly. And it's always a tragic thing when, when God's people act as bad as or worse than the unsaved. It sends a wrong message, doesn't it? A terrible message. And sadly, uh, unfortunately, we, we know lots of occasions where that has occurred. And so it's very strange and shocking that Israel would be like those, he says here, who hated their husbands. Uh, kind of an amazing statement. Again, as we, we, we read the top text, he says, uh, as is the mother, so is the daughter, verse 45, thou art thy mother's daughter that loatheth her husband and her children, and thou art the sisters of thy sisters, which loathe their husbands and their children. Your mother was a Hittite and your father an Amorite. And again, again very sad, isn't it, that um, what an awful thing, you know, against the last days we're told um, that the world will be characterized by people who are without natural affection. And here's an example, uh, loathing your husbands and loathing your children. That's not a good thing. And that's what God is saying about uh, Judah. Uh, they're those that love their husbands. And of course, um, their husband was Jehovah. And their conduct was basically saying, God, I hate you. I despise you. Because they were not, they were, as we saw in this chapter, they're constantly playing the whore. They're, 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 they're not in, in the worst kind of a way. And so in a very real sense, uh, Jehovah, the covenant husband of the nation, and he was a perfect husband. It wasn't like he was a bad husband. He was a perfect husband, and yet uh, they, th the bad marriage was completely their responsibility because they were adulterous and despised them. And it is interesting, even in the New Testament, when it talks about, uh, for instance, let me just read it. It just comes to mind as I'm thinking about this that we actually despise God when we are involved in immorality. So I'll give you an example. First Thessalonians 4, very challenging passage. It says in verse um, 7, God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Good to be reminded, isn't it? That part of the reason God saved you is that he wants you now to live a holy life, a life of devotion to him, separated to him, separated from the world. Call us not to uncleanness, to holiness. He therefore, verse eight, that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who was also given unto us his holy spirit. So just as he says to them, you're loathing your husband, if we're involved in sexual deviancy as a child of God, we're saying, God, we, we despise you. <laughs> because God has given us his Holy Spirit, and he lives within us. And we're showing we despise this holy heavenly guest by our immoral conduct. And so really very, very challenging passage. Uh, and again, New Testament parallels are clear. And so he says, you, you've loathed them. Your mother was a Hittite, your father an Amorite. Amorite. Verse 46, and they says, And thine el elder sister is Samaria, she and her daughters that dwell at thy left hand. And thy younger sister that dwelleth at thy right hand is Sodom and her daughters. And now he's making a comparison between Jerusalem and the uh, Samaria, which was the capital of the northern kingdom, and then Sodom. And so it, why does he say at your left hand and your right hand? Well, that uh, left hand and right hand is based on the fact that um, when you are in the land of Israel, because the ocean is on the west, <laughs> and Jerusalem, the capital, is going east. So if you're stood in Jerusalem looking eastwards, your left hand, that would be north of you, would indeed be Samaria, where the northern capital of the northern kingdom was. And again, if you're still facing eastwards and you're looking southwards, your right hand would be where the Dead Sea is and where Sodom was. And so again, it's just giving us the geographical details, in a sense, of where these two nations were, or one a nation, the other a city-state. And so 
the city of Samaria, the capital city of the long conquered northern kingdom of Israel. Let's just uh, show that that is what it's referring to. First Kings uh, chapter 16. Your sister Samaria. And so he talks about verse 24 and 29. 24 through 29 of 1 Corinthians 16, 1 Kings 16. It says, he bought the hill of Samaria of, of Shema for two talents of silver and built on the hill and called the name of the city which he built after the name of Shema, owner of the hill Samaria. But Omri wrought evil in the eyes of the Lord and did worse than all that were before him. For he walked in all the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and in the sin wherewith he made Israel to sin, to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger with her vanities. Now the rest of the acts of Omri, which he did, and uh, his might that he showed, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Om Omri slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria, and Ahab, his son, reigned in his stead. And so there we have this wicked place of Samaria. And again, what a terrible thing when he's basically going to make the comparison and say, you were worse than them. You're worse than Samaria. And then, of course, uh, we know all about Sodom. Uh, it's one thing to be compared negatively with Samaria, but to be compared negatively with Sodom is the ultimate. And so he says that Jerusalem state was far worse than that. She was like Sodom with all her infamous corruptions. Of course, we read about that in Genesis chapter 13 and Genesis chapter 19. And uh, we'll be referring to those passages as we continue. So Ezekiel calls Samaria, notice the elder sister, and Sodom the younger sister. And so notice again uh, that uh, this language, verse 46, thine elder sister is Samaria, she and her daughters that dwell in thy left hand, and thy younger sister that dwelleth at thy right hand, Sodom and her daughters. Of course, we know that chronologically, <laughs> that's not really true. Chronologically, Sodom existed long before Samaria. And so we have to ask ourselves, what is going on here? Now, the Hebrew terms are literally big and small, respectively. So the idea of the, the elder is big, and the small is small, or, or the younger is small. So Ezekiel has in view their historical importance to those whom the prophet addressed. Describing Samaria as the elder sister is due to its greater status as a nation, right? It was the 10 tribes. It was, it was a, a national entity. On the other hand, Sodom is cited because of its more lowly position as a city-state. So in terms of chronology, Sodom would have considerably predated Samaria, but this passage is dealing with the moral character and responsibility here. And so basically, it's saying that Samaria is the elder sister because of its larger size, and Sodom the younger because of its smaller city-state status. So verse 47 says yet this, Yet hast thou not walked after their ways, nor done after their abominations. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if the verse stopped there? <laughs> if God was saying, you haven't walked after their ways, nor done after their abominations. But then we see this word, but. It says, as if that were a very little thing, thou wast corrupted more than they in all thy ways. Now, folks, this is a staggering accusation for God to make. You are worse than them. Jerusalem's sin had been the more heinous in that she had professed to set the standard for her sisters, whereas she had been more abominable than they. In fact, we're going to see some details of that in a little while, uh, why this was more serious, why their sin was counted to be greater. But notice verse 48, it's this statement again, very solemn vow. As I live, saith the Lord God, 
in the words God basically saying, I am the living God, and as I live, so it's kind of a very, very strong statement, saith the Lord God, Sodom thy sister hath not done, she nor her daughters, as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. And so uh, what, what an amazing thing to say. Uh, Sodom, wicked as it was, could not be compared to Judah. Now, again, I want to remind you of the Lord's words, too, when he was speaking in to his generation. If you remember his words, he said to his generation, the Lord Jesus, I'm saying to you, it'll be more tolerable, tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than to you. Now, why is that? And the, the reason is simple. They had more light. Sodom had no Bible. The greater the light rejected, the more serious the judgment. In fact, the only light Sodom had was Lot, a compromised believer. And so they they did not have so much light. But as you compare that with uh, the cities that Jesus is speaking to, they had the very eternal Son of God walking in their midst, doing miracles that were undeniable. And so he says, absolutely more tolerable. And so again, it brings to us this, this principle that we've seen frequently in our studies, but light brings greater responsibility. The greater light, the greater the responsibility. Uh, that's why, you know, for us, we're, the more we spend time in the word of God, the more accountable we are. That's why it says don't be many teachers because you will receive a stricter judgment because you've got more light. You're claiming better understanding. And the, the better taught you are, the more responsible you are to God for your actions. This is a very solemn thing. So it begins to define the sins of Sodom in verses 49 and 50 and describe them. And it's very interesting. He says, behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. And then he lists them, pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness was in her and her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty and committed abominations before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. So he begins to detail their problems. And the first one, of course, is pride. He says, the iniquity of thy sister Sodom Right. And of course, uh, sin basically is a pride problem. The very first sin, uh, not in the Garden of Eden so much, but again, that would be true too. The very first sin was when Lucifer says, uh, I will be like the most high. He, again, not content with the position he has. He wants uh, He wants greater. And so it's a, pride is a very serious, serious thing. And of course, uh, the, in the land of Sodom, we read in Genesis 13, 10, it was like the garden of the Lord. And so it was obviously, a, it's a kind of city that its citizens would take pride in. Let me just read that verse uh, in Genesis 13, 10, just to give us the idea of what God is saying. Because it really was a, a very lush and beautiful place. Lot lifted up his eyes and behold in the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, again, land of Egypt, very fertile because of the river Nile, as thou comest unto Zoar. And so really a, a place to be proud about, very beautiful, very lush, uh, greenery, all the rest of it. And so I guess the question would be this, how can a country or individual know if it's falling prey to the sin of pride. How do we how do we even get an inkling if that's our issue? Because sometimes uh, a proud person is blind to it. You know, the only uh, person that can't see it is the one that has it. It's kind of a, an eye problem anyway. But it says, uh, how, how can a country, an individual, know it's falling prey to the sin of pride? And the, here's the answer, by prayerlessness. Isn't that interesting? By prayerlessness. Pride is the reason people stop praying. Pride is identified most perfectly by its middle letter, I. I can do it. I can get through this day successfully. I can raise my family. I can handle my occupation. I do not need God's help. 
And so that's what pride is. And of course, um, if you and I are not praying, it's the essence of pride because we think we can make it through life on our own power. And so the sin of Sodom, first sin of Sodom was they were filled with pride. Satisfaction in her prosperity. God had blessed her abundantly. It says not only pride, but fullness of bread. But because of the fertile conditions, there was an amazing abundance. Uh, this There was agricultural abundance in Sodom. It made people self-reliant, sinfully independent, and overly invested in just having a good time, entertainments, and comforts. And so he says, here's your sins, pride, fullness of bread. And then the third thing is abundance of idleness. Too much time on your hands can be a very, very dangerous thing. And so uh, he talks about the uh, this, this time of abundance of idleness. And of course, that's what gets people into trouble. That's what gets a lot of people into trouble is when they have too much time on their hands. We the classic example in the scripture that we know of is the story of David. Do you remember the time when kings are supposed to go to war? And David is getting a suntan on his roof and uh, sees things that he ought not to see, and he gets himself into a lot of trouble. And so you can see that, the, in a sense, the more a culture uh, becomes uh, known for its abundance, uh, for its uh, prosperity. Um, and along with that, with that prosperity becomes uh, an abundance of idleness. It's a recipe for disaster. And we can see it unfolding before our very eyes. We can see those things in our own culture. And so point by point, God listed some of the sins of Sodom the sins listed here are alluded to in Genesis, but not specifically detailed. Some wrongly have taken this to mean that God is not considering their sexual depravity as sin. <laughs> you know, people in the uh, that are trying to push the homosexual agenda, they'll say, you see, the sin of Sodom, it, it was pride, fullness of abundance of idleness. It's not, it's not the what we call sodomy and all those other things. But in a sense, what we could say is this, that these conditions make it favorable for the kind of sins that occurred in the city of Sodom. It, it, it's really a sin of an affluent culture. That's really it, what happens. The more affluent a culture becomes. In, in other words, if you're in a culture where you're just daily trying to survive, where every day is a struggle to put food on the table. You don't have time to think about all these deviant things. And so it's generally not seen in those kind of cultures. But in a culture where uh, abundance of, idols, uh, of idleness is seen because of wealth, it leads to these kind of sins. So the people of Sodom evidently put a high priority, it would seem, on recreation and you know all this free time and it was no longer using that time to develop relationship with god but instead to indulge in things that were totally prohibited in fact it says verse 50 they were haughty and committed abomination before me and so in that verse you have a, a reference to what we know of in chapter 19 all of the things that were there, the homosexual lifestyle that is so evident. I mean, and again, it wasn't just homosexual lifestyle, it was homosexual rape that was involved here. They wanted those men to, against their will, to rape them uh, in a homosexual way. So again, what we could say is this, that the more affluent a society is, the more it gives itself over <laughs> to uh, these immoral things, abominations. And can we see, in one sense, in our Western culture, it's very challenging to live for God because we have the very same environment that was seen in Sodom. We, we do 
live in a land of prosperity. We do have more free time than probably any previous generation. <laughs> so there's opportunity for abundance of idleness if we don't use it for the glory of God. And that pride, that self-centeredness uh, that's all about me leads to all kinds of perversions. And so God brought his judgment to Sodom and her sisters, and that would be Sodom and Gomorrah, the surrounding little areas. He would bring the same to Jerusalem and Judah, who in many ways we're going to see were worse than Sodom. He says, therefore, I took them away as I saw good. Of course, we know the story. God raining down fire and brimstone on Sodom. God took them away. And of course, now it's no longer that land of uh, fertility and prosperity. But if you've been to the Dead Sea area, you know uh, that it's it's very, uh, very barren uh, because God brought down his judgment upon it. So verse 51, neither hath Samaria committed half of thy sins, but thou hast multiplied thine abominations more than they and has justified thy sisters in all thine abominations which thou hast done. So again, very, very, uh, indict very strong indictments against them. Samaria, you see, had already been judged by the Assyrian captivity. Samaria, Samaria fell 130 years prior to Jerusalem. So Judah had much more time to indulge in sin. And instead of learning from the lesson of the judgment of Sodom and learning from the lesson of the judgment on Samaria, the captivity of, of Samaria to the Assyrians, actually the nation got more involved in sin in those 130 years. And so it had more time to indulge in sin. And again, the sin was more serious because Samaria, just remind ourselves, it had no temple in terms of a biblical temple, God-ordained temple. It had no priests. Uh, they set up worthless men <laughs> up there in the northern kingdom. Uh, it had no good kings. Uh, in the story of Judah, there, there are several good kings. But in the story of Israel, there are no good kings. And so it exceeded, Judah exceeded uh, Samaria in a wickedness because, again, it, despite the light and despite the examples of God's judgment, they failed to learn the lesson. They failed to look to the good examples and they out Samaria as well. And so again, how tragic. And so he says, um, uh, verse 52, thou also which hast judged thy sisters bear thine own shame for thy sins that thou hast committed more abominable than they they are more righteous than thou, yea, be thou confounded also and bear thy shame in that thou hast justified thy sisters. Says it twice, says it in verse 51, and has justified thy sisters, says it here in verse 52, and has justified thy sisters. So the, the thought is simply this, that Jerusalem's deeds were so bad it made Samaria and Sodom look justified in comparison. <laughs> That's a staggering thought, isn't it? In other words, any woman who puts these women in a good light should be ashamed of herself. That's the thought. <laughs> Actually making them look virtuous is the thought. Um, uh, so um, the, their sin, Judah actually made Sodom and Samaria look good by comparison. And so again, we, we mentioned this, but the Lord Jesus uh, also makes similar comparisons. Let's just remind ourselves of them. Look at Matthew 10, Matthew's gospel, chapter 10 of the nation of Israel in his day. Um, verse 15 Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. That's the city that rejects the testimony of the apostolic delegates that, that have been sent out. Uh, if you reject that light, more tolerable. Chapter 11 and verse 23 and 24 
again it says this, and thou Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Now, again, is, aren't these staggering statements? And again, it's, it's almost like the Lord in his foreknowledge is saying, if the miracles that had been done in Capernaum, remember that was the Lord Jesus' headquarters for his ministry. And so many of the miracles would have been done in that region. And he said, if that had been done in Sodom, it would still be standing to this day. Implication being they would have repented had they heard that message. And so, again, very staggering to think about it. Ezekiel lived among a people who feel shame because Jehovah, in whom they had placed their trust, in their minds had reneged on his commit covenant commitment and failed to stand up for them. And the purpose of this entire oracle has been to turn the tables on the Israelites' complaint, and the charge of betrayal is to be leveled not against Jehovah, but against themselves. They had despised their husband. They had exceeded Sodom and Samaria in their sin. So we might ask the question, what about the church today? Because sadly, professing believers have often acted worse than the world. Believers, and we see it in Corinthians, in the assembly there, taking one another to, to lawsuits, <laughs> uh, divorces, uh, immorality, family feuds, crooked business dealings, financial scandals, and worse. And so we cannot think we're immune from all this. Our flesh, if left unjudged, is no better than the next man's. Except the difference is we have more light and are more responsible for our actions than the next man. And uh, I remember years and years ago in um, when we were students in the new tribes in training, uh, we had uh, uh, one session where at that time the, the, the chairman of the mission uh, a brother came, he's now with the Lord, but he just took a session and he talked about the reasons why missionaries had been dismissed from the mission field. And he just went through a list and it was horrendous. And and the, the point that he was making is just because you have a heart for missions doesn't mean that you're going to live a perfect life unless you deal with the flesh on a daily basis. We are capable of the same or worse than the next man. And so that's the point here. And yet we'd be sinning against greater light. And that's why holiness of life is so, so important that we take seriously walking with the Lord. We take seriously dealing with sin on a daily basis. We, 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 we live that dependent life, not that prideful self-independence, but every single day, even before we put our feet on the floor, we ought to say, Lord, I can't live this life unless your Holy Spirit works in my life today. It's not going to work very well. I need you to keep me close to yourself, to keep me from evil. Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Deliver us from evil. That should be a daily prayer. Uh, keep me from evil today. Verse 53, it says, When I shall bring again their captivity, the captivity of Sodom and her daughters, and the captivity of Samaria and her daughters, then will I bring again the captivity of thy captives in the midst of thee. So God is promising here some kind of restoration for Sodom and Samaria. And that Jerusalem would also be restored and their captives brought back. Now, the promise of bringing back the captives of Samaria is pretty easy to understand. And we may see its fulfillment. But this fulfillment of a promise to Sodom is much more difficult <laughs> to understand. A surface reading of 50, 50, verse 53 and onwards can be confusing because nowhere does the recovery of Sodom appear in scripture. The complete destruction of Sodom recorded in the book of Genesis doesn't seem to leave any room for reinstatement because the whole thing was burned up. But Ezekiel, speaking 
of a national restoration of these cities in the millennial kingdom. Evidently, Sodom will be rebuilt at that time and will become fertile and prosperous again. Now, part of the reason we know that the, the area will be prosperous again is because of Ezekiel 47. Ezekiel 47, which talks about <clears throat> this uh, millennial temple, which is an exciting part of the book. And it talks about the waters that are going to come out of that millennial temple. And uh, we'll just take the time to read it. This um, uh, In verse 1, he says, Afterwards he brought me again, this is Ezekiel 47, 1, unto the door of the house, and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward, for the forefront of the house stood toward the east. And the waters came down from under, from the right side of the house, at the south side of the altar. Then brought he me out of the way of the gate northward, and led me about the way without unto the utter gate, by the way that looketh eastward. And behold, there ran out waters on the right side. And when the main, uh, the man sorry, that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits. He brought me through the waters. The waters were to the ankles. And then he goes on and talks about the progress of the waters to the knees and and, and uh, even up to the waist and then big enough to swim in, in verse uh, 5 and then verse 6. Then he said to me, Son of man, uh, hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. Now when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river were very many trees on the one side and on the other. So again, we've seen a lush uh, fertility uh, connected with these waters. Then said he unto me, These waters issue out toward the east country and go down to the desert and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. So this is the healing of the waters of the Dead Sea. And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth, whithersoever the rivers shall come, shall live, and there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither, but they shall be healed, and everything shall live whither the river cometh. And it shall come to pass that the fishes shall stand upon it from Engedi, even unto Engelaim, and they shall be a place to spread forth nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds, as the fish of the great sea, exceeding many. So as many kind of fish as there are in the great sea, that's the Mediterranean Sea, will be in the in the Dead Sea, which will now be, have its waters healed, and they'll even be doing commercial fishing in that sea at that time. Uh, the miry places thereof and the marshes thereof shall not be healed, they shall be given to salt, but by the river upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that side shall grow all trees for meat, whose leaves shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for med medicine. And so again, I want to suggest to you that uh, the area that was once known as Sodom, which was once called the like the Garden of the Lord, <laughs> is once again going to be like the Garden of the Lord, and there'll be some kind of reconstruction of that area known as the city of Sodom, as well as a restoration of Samaria. Verse 54, it says, Then thou mayest bear thine own shame, and mayest be confounded, confounded in all that thou hast done, in that thou art a comfort unto them. So part of the reason... God promises to restore the captivity of Samaria and Sodom was to humble Jerusalem and Judah. They would know that they were not the unique objects of God's favor and restoration. His love was wider than that. So that both the northern kingdom, who they would have despised at one time and looked down on because of their departure from God, and Sodom, who they would have looked down on, and yet they're going to be restored to make them humble and realize that they are not the sole objects of God's grace and favor.
Verse 55, when thy sister Sodom and her daughters shall return to the former estate, Samaria and her daughters shall return to their former estate, then that then thou and thy daughters shall return to your former estate. Now, we need to deal with something here because some people have taken this scripture to say that God is going to basically um, bring restitution to the wicked dead because it talks about Sodom and her daughters. And so the idea is that the wicked dead are one day going to be restored to God in what is sometimes known as the wider hope. Now, again, we have to recognize that this is nonsense. And let me just show you from the book of Jude concerning the eternal destiny and fate of those that were destroyed in Sodom uh, by divine judgment. It says in verse 7 of Jude, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering, now notice this, the vengeance of eternal fire. So there's no thought here that those people of Sodom are going to be brought out of their punishment and restored to the land. All it's simply saying is that that area is going to be restored in the coming millennial kingdom to its former prosperity and will be inhabited again. And so that is the thought that is being brought before us. So again, um, he's talking about national restoration, the rebuilding of those cities in the millennial kingdom. Verse 56, for thy sister Sodom was not mentioned by thy mouth in the day of thy pride. And so Judah, um, when it was uh, still standing and the northern kingdom had been destroyed and Sodom had been destroyed, they be they became very haughty and lifted up with pride and were, were different to them. And in their pride, they wouldn't even mention the name of Sodom. It was kind of uh, considered beneath them. And now, of course, she has gone and out sinned the very city that they didn't even take upon their lips. And so what a tragedy. And again, the danger, again, for ourselves is that we can look down on others and forget that we are just as capable. What does the scripture say? He that thinks he stands, take heed, lest he also fall. And when you hear of some servant of God or some person falling into sin, your thought should be this, but for the grace of God, there go I, because my heart is no different. And my, the capabilities of my flesh are no different than any other man. And so it really is a challenge to humility, brethren, really, to and to, to dependence on the Lord, because we know what our hearts are really like if we're really honest. And so verse 57, before thy wickedness was discovered, as at the time of thy reproach of the daughters of Syria, and all that are round about her, the daughters of the Philistines, which despise thee round about. And again... <laughs> The, the surrounding nations, remember we saw earlier on in our study of this chapter, that the Philistines, at least they were loyal to their gods and didn't run after every other god. They actually were shocked at Judah's conduct. And same of Syria. Uh, these nations that are around about them are, are just shocked at the, uh, the multiple uh, unfaithfulness and adulteries of the nation of Israel. And again, when the when the unsaved world is shocked at the conduct of the so-called professed people of God, that's a tragedy. And that's the idea that's being brought before us here. Thou was born thy lewdness and thine abominations, verse 58, saith the Lord. And so the day would come when God season, God's season of discipline and judgment over Jerusalem and Judah would pass. In some sense, uh, we, we know that it did cure them of their previous idolatry, uh, but it was also designed to cause them to move forward in humility rather than pride because of the damage their testimony had done. It ought to indeed have humbled them.
Verse 59, for thus saith the Lord God, I will even deal with thee as thou hast done, which has despised the oath in breaking the covenant. And again, really, this is all going back to the Mosaic covenant and the fact that they had despised the oath. They'd said all that the Lord says unto us, we will do. They had entered into a covenant agreement with God, They agreed to follow him, to be his people, to walk in his ways, and they had not kept their covenant. They'd been unfaithful to their husband throughout it all. And yet, verse 60 through 63, this kind of sad chapter ends in a very positive note. The promise of restoration of the nation by covenant. And again, it's a testament to the faithfulness of God. Second Timothy 2, 13, if we believe not yet, he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Aren't we thankful that we have a God who is faithful? In fact, our midweek meeting this week, we had a few opportunities for brethren to share testimonies of God's faithfulness to them in their lives. And uh, it was wonderful, very, very encouraging uh, to, to give examples of how we've seen the faithfulness of God in our lives. And so certainly uh, God is faithful to his covenant, even if the nation were unfaithful, God is faithful to his covenant. So he says in verse 60, nevertheless, I will remember my covenant. Kind of ironic, I will remember. They were not remembering. Remember we said that part of the big deal here was that they forgot where they'd come from, what God had done for them. Uh, back in verse 22, in all thine abominations and thy whoredoms, thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth. They'd forgotten. Verse 43, because thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth. So that it's almost like they'd forgotten where God had taken them from, the, the pit from which he had lifted them out of. They forgot all that. But what's good to know is that if even when they forget, God doesn't forget. I will remember my covenant with thee in the days of thy youth. They forgot, but he did not. And I will establish unto thee an everlasting covenant. So he's going to come out with another covenant with them. But this one, an everlasting covenant. And so what a wonderful thing that God is going to establish another covenant. He remembers the, his marriage covenant, now commits to establishing an everlasting covenant with them. And what is that everlasting covenant? I want to suggest to you that it's talking about the new covenant uh, that God is going to establish with the nation of Israel and with Judah. And so let's just, uh, again, just a couple of scriptures to remind ourselves of the new covenant that are really wonderful scriptures. Jeremiah 31, God is, has got a plan. And he is going to fulfill it. He's going to keep his side of the bargain. He's going to overcome all of the problems the nation has by entering into a new covenant with them. Verse 31 of Jeremiah 31, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I'll put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God. And they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Oh, what grace uh, the Lord shows here. Uh, remember their sin no more. Forgive their iniquity. Of course, it's mentioned in other places too, uh, several references, Ezekiel 36, we won't take time to read it right now. Verse 25 and 26 also reiterates this new covenant that he is going to initiate with them. And so verse 61, then thou shalt remember thy ways and be ashamed when thou shalt receive thy sisters, thine elder and thy younger, and I will give them unto thee for daughters, but not by thy covenant. So again, the idea is that... Um, as God deals with them in grace, they'll remember thy ways and be ashamed. 
And it is it is true in a sense, isn't it? You know, even for us who are saved, uh, sometimes we we can look back in our unsaved days and we feel a deep sense of shame, the depths of our sin, even prior to our salvation. And that's why we say, we'll wonder how he could love me when you know what you're like. And so they're going to remember how wicked they were and now see their new position in grace. And they're just going to marvel at that. And this restoration would indeed bring humility to Israel, not only toward God, but to also those that he had, they had previously despised and judged, like uh, Samaria and Sodom. They, they're no longer going to be looking down on others. They're just going to be amazed that God ever saved them and God ever was good to them. And so he's going to establish his covenant. But our time is gone. We'll have to pick up at verse 62 next time and then into chapter 17. May the Lord encourage us to be humbled by what God has done for wretches like us and to cleave to him because we certainly do not want to cause the unsaved world to look at us and say, that man says he's a Christian and he's worse than us. May God deliver us from that. Amen.